I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the I'm really going to do my very best to get through this without crying. So I'm going to throw in a couple of jokes and I'm going to try and keep my composure here. Just the other day, my brother and I have been spending a lot of time you know, discussing the death of my dad, which was very sudden but not untimely. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail. But one of the things that he said to me, he sent me a WhatsApp message. And it really resonated with both him and myself. And that message was, don't regret that dad's life is over. Be thankful that it existed. Because in times like this, it's very easy to focus on the loss and to totally forget about the amazing life and the amazing father that we had. So I'd like that to be the focus of what we take away today. So we celebrate what actually happened. We celebrate the life of Jose and my dad. We don't celebrate his, or we don't focus and fixate on his passing. Now we understand there's a time for mourning, and that is natural, and that is something that we all go through. But my dad, I believe, had a remarkable life. And as we pay our final respects today, I'd just like to take some time to go through some of these things that really stood out for me. I was one of the very few privileged children, I think, in this sort of age to have a day that was solid. And that, I think, we underestimate. Because having a father figure that takes you and teaches you and is always there for you, sets you up to be a fully functional it really is something that I am totally grateful for. And I attribute a lot of my achievements to what my dad did and how he taught me. And how calm he was and how he was just always, always there for me. I really have to say that my dad, and I'm not being wise, was one of the most dependable people that I've known. And that goes, I've heard it over and over uh, from Everyone after his death, people just say, you know, John was always there. He was so dependable. My dad was referred to as many things. A lot of people called him Mr. D, Jose, Joe, and in his latter years, they called him Papa Joe. Very often, kids would come home and they would say to me, well, they would say to my dad, what do we call you? And one of the things that I always remember about my dad and Ralph had, he would always make the same joke. He would say, do whatever you like, just don't call me late for lunch. <laughs> that is how I remember my dad, and that is what he said over and over again. Another time I remember when I was six years old, and my dad was trying to encourage me to get involved in sports. And he said to me, son, you need to go to soccer. And I was like, oh, Dad, I can't play soccer. He's like, you need to get out there, you need to go and do some soccer practice. So I went to the soccer practice. And I was this. I've got to tell you, I got in the car, as a tiny little guy, I said to my dad, I said, how was soccer practice? And how did it go? I said to him, Dad, it was a disaster. I touched the ball once. The other kids were kicking the ball, scoring goals, running around. I touched the ball. You know what my dad said? He didn't focus on the absolute dismal soccer practice. He said, My son, what you gotta do is next week when you go back, I was like, Oh, I'm not going back. He said, Next week when you go back, you need to touch the ball four times. Now it's only that I'm older, and I can realize that that is still absolutely a disaster. But what he had done as a father. 
for that. See, it's set a goal for you. As bad as it was, it was something that I was striving for. I was trying to achieve to touch the ball four times. So far below my peers, yet still having a goal. And when I went back to the clock, to the second week, I was so proud because I had actually managed to touch the ball eight times. And I've often reflected on that and I've just thought, there were so many more fathers in the world that went why are their children in such a small way? You would have such better men, you would have men of substance and men of character. Now my dad also had very other, a lot of other mannerisms and he did things his own way. And a lot of you know he was a gentle, kind, loving soul, and that's what he was. But he could also be full of nonsense in many ways. When I was in standard five, grade seven, I broke my arm. And it was quite a serious break, it was my elbow. My arm was in cluster for months. And the doctors, when I finally got out, my arm was locked in this position, couldn't straighten it. The doctors got my mom and dad into the uh, you know, practice, and they said to my mom and dad, your son needs physiotherapy. He really needs, otherwise it's going to take years for his arm to straighten. So the doctor expressed the need for physiotherapy, my mom got it. Even me, as a young man, whatever I was told or thought I understood that physiotherapy as we were walking out of that hospital. My dad said, in true Jose style, this doctor's talking nonsense. You're getting a tennis racket. There's no physiotherapy nonsense. You're going to get on that board and start playing tennis. That's how I started playing tennis. And my arm's fine now. So it might not be conventional. But we're going to get into that a little bit later. And how my dad had this sort of decision making process. As gentle and kind as he was, once he made a decision, that was it. And he had a lot of, I need to choose my words carefully here because what comes to mind is I want to say disrespect for the medical fraternity, but in many ways he was right. And that is also what, in, what led to the end. But as I said, we'll get back to that. Something I learned. Just two days ago, when I reached my uncle from the uh, airport, he said, My dad's dad, or my grandfather, who I never met because he died before I was born, he died in 1965, was cremated in this very uh, same cemetery. So, just we got to a little bit earlier, we spent a little bit of time looking for the plaque, we couldn't find it. I mean, it was 57 years ago. But it's just a nice bit of history. Maybe a nice bit of closure to, to know that my dad's dad was buried here, my dad's uh, cremated, my dad's going to be cremated here. It's so, uh, an interesting bit of information. Let's talk a bit more about the medical side of things and my dad's attitude towards doctors. My mom passed away from cancer, and the doctor said to us, Look, this is hereditary. You know, you guys. He was talking to, to me and my brother, you guys need to have colonoscopies. He's there with five years after the age of 50. And then he said to my dad, you know, you're getting on in years, you also need to have a colonoscopy. So I went, my brother went, you know, we're doing the, the right thing. When it came to my dad's chance to go for his colonoscopy or even to book it, what he said to me was, my son. I would rather die before I allow a doctor to put a camera up my bum. <laughs> and that was just how it was. We tried, but it was just not going to happen. He was never going for that moment. Even with COVID, we isolated my dad, we were all very concerned. My brother, and his wife, were home from the States. We brought my dad food, we got himself isolated. This was in stage five. We made sure that he had everything he needed. It was quite good. He stayed isolated for a period of time. And one day I got the phone call. The phone call went like this. I've done it your way, I've done it last way, I'm going out today. <laughs> if this COVID gets me, I'll die, I'll die. What I'm not doing is staying in this house another day. I'm going shopping. 
live my life until I die. And that's how my dad was. Once that decision was made, it was made. My dad was a highly skilled tradesman. I used to always refer to him as an inventor of gadgets. It was anything that you needed, any little contraption that you could roll with his hand, he was highly skilled with. He was able to make it, he was able to think about it, conceptualize it, build it. And this is something that is passed on to me. I mean, you had my, my brother and myself working on um, all types of projects when we were young, fixing our own cars. And those are things and skills that in this day and age are starting to lose because of, of computers. And it's just nice to have had a father that was so hands on with his children and helped us and taught us. And those are just amazing memories that I've always, always had on my back. But that was, I'm going to just focus a bit on this dependability. He was dependable as a father. Always. He was dependable to my friends. Always. He was dependable as a husband. He gave me a plan, which I would like to invite you guys after, which is going to have a look at. I'm just going to read this to you. And this will just give you some idea of my dad's character. He got married in 1965. My mom, Gloria, put the ring on his finger at the wedding ceremony. And as it says in this plaque, he never took it off for any reason. It didn't matter if his hands were covered in grease, he was working on a car. It didn't matter if he was turning on a wall. It didn't matter if he went to the airport, security, he never, ever took that ring off. When my mom passed away, he came in and told me, out of respect for my mom, he would wear the ring until the next wedding anniversary. And at the next wedding anniversary, which was the 18th of December 2016, he took the ring off, he wiped the black. That was just a small insight, a little bit of a fraction of the type of dedication my dad often thought. The type of things he did, I mean, you don't often see people writing something like this, something that we will have, we will understand, and we can maybe implement in our lives in some type of way. So when we finish that, guys, for those of you that would like to come and join the friends and family. We're all going to have eats and snacks at my house. Right. But just before we go, spend a second or two, just look at the photos and uh, you know, take a second to pay your final respects. My dad was wished to be cremated. That was something that he made very clear, as did my mom. That's why we are going to honor their wishes and uh, follow through with the cremation. My dad died while he was living, which is something that I'm very grateful for and I'm sure he's very grateful for. So what do I mean by that if I say he died while he was living? Well, simply put, he was functioning, working, he was interacting, we all knew him, and then he was dead, it was a sudden shock. But it wasn't untimely. But so much so that he was working, he was renovating one of the flats. You now, a couple of days before his death, after his passing, we went and took his tools off site. That's how active, fit, and healthy my dad was. And I know from many discussions that that is the way he wanted to go. And to be fair, I'm sure we all, in some way or shape, want to go that way. No one wants to be bedridden or burdened or in a bad place. That pass away. So when we got to the hospital with my dad and it was too late, a lady came there and she was very kind. She gave us and I got a uh, We were both in quite a bad state because it was, it was very unsettling to make it. And even then, I realized because of the discussions that I've had with my dad about death, we used to speak about death freedom, so we don't want to do this when we find it out. And um, I realized even in my broken state at that time in the hospital, that we were the lucky ones because 
We are not that we're sitting in ICU hoping to have a final conversation. So when I say my dad died while he was living, you see this memorial photo. But I want to take a second to just show you where I took this photo from and what, what he was doing on this day. This is how the real photo was. As you can see, he was fishing with me, his grandkids, there's another guy in the background teaching, keeping him teaching him how to fish, he was giving fishing lessons. And that's a very special way to remember a grandpa, to remember a guy that was loving, kind, caring, always there. And that is my dad, the whole Roger, in his natural state, with his kids. Always on the fish. So that is one of the fond memories. And that wasn't a lot of food fish often. He would teach the boys to fish. He would still teach me to fish after many, many years. I mean, I've grown up fishing with my dad, which is, which is a very special photo. My dad was not afraid of death. He was always, he always used to tell me, when I die, I'm gone. Don't, don't waste any uh, effort. Don't waste any money. Let's, let's enjoy life. He was courageous. That was one of the reasons he wasn't afraid of death. But he was just courageous as a father. I've always been as courageous. In fact, I'm just going to interject with a little story, which I thought I was not going to share today. But you know what? I'm going to share it. Because sometimes in life, there is an opportunity to fight. And my dad was kind, loving, logical. He was just such a solid person. But one day, I was in standard four. And I was walking home from school as my brother and I did. And there, far in the distance, I saw a man sitting on a double fence. I saw two figures in the dust next to him. I was like, oh, I wonder what's going on there. There's a, there's a young boy. I walked up. And as I got closer, I started to realize that's my dad. Sitting in the park, he should have been at work. What was he doing there? And when I got there, I found there was one guy lying on the floor bleeding and another guy lying next to him. And I said, Dad, what happened? Because now he said, I'm waiting for the police. I was like, what? what's going on? He said, your mom found me, I was at work. There were three men breaking into the house. I rushed home. I caught this guy here. His friend tried to help me. And the third one got away. He had made them cop, they were knocked out and we were waiting for the police. And as shocking as that was, shocking as that story is, you know, as a young man, you start to realize that this gentle person, that was not all that he was. There was a lot more to just like Susan. He could actually fight when it was awful, be gentle and was needed. And that inspired me and got me thinking. And I've thought about that many times. That I've grown with that, I've understood that, and it, it's, it's part of life's lessons. Another reason why my dad was not afraid of death is because he was very sure about where he was going. He loved Jesus, he loved God, God was his personal savior. And he always told me he's going to be a place where he passes away. He was going to be with my mom, he's going to be with Save people that he had fellowship with. He always told me that uh, he's on borrowed time. He believed that you have three score and ten, which is how the Bible calls. One score is 20 years, so three score and ten means 70 years. And he used to often tell me, oh, well, I've done my three score and ten, and I'm on borrowed time. And he was on just under nine years of borrowed time. So, he certainly had, let's say a good means, a long, fulfilling, I believe, happy life. Something else which I like to share because it's a thing that it brings closure to a lot of people. My dad went to the doctor months or weeks before he passed away. 
Because he had ulcers and stomach ache. We said to him, okay, so how did the guy talk about that? He said, okay, I've got to go for a sonar. And he went for the sonar, and he went for a couple of visits. And uh, we asked him, how's it going? He said, no, he's got medication, everything's fine. In fact, he may quote his words that he shared with myself, my brother, and Sue. I'm going to live another hundred years. The doctor says, oh, great. So, we believe that that was the case. But after he passed away, he phoned the doctor. <laughs> the doctor had a totally different story. He said, because they had an aneurysm that was serious, I told him he needs to have vascular surgery and he needs to go and see the vascular surgeon. Gave him a referral letter and gave him all, told him what needed to be done. And we can only speculate, we can only imagine what my dad did. I think it went something like this to the referral letter. You know, I'm not doing this nonsense, I'm not going to this doctor. I'm sure that's what he said. We don't know. But it seems that that is actually what caused, caused him to die. The reason I say it wasn't an untimely death is because there came a time in us as a family, I sat my boys down, we had a discussion. I said to them, when you lose someone in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, that is a tragedy, that is untimely death. If a father buries a son or a mother buries a daughter, that is a tragedy. When someone willingly, and I think each and every one of us today, we can't say, well, Joe, you could have saved your life. We need to be respectful of his decisions because we know. Or Joe like that. We know that he took swift, concise, exact decisions as to how he was going to live or die. And I was at that most respect in my day. And I haven't spent any time thinking he should have gone for that surgery and could have saved him. I thought that I respect you. You've always been sound mind, you've always understood what was happening, been knowledgeable. I respect that decision that you made. It might have been nice if you had discussed it with your family. But I have sure respect for you. We accept that. My brother and I have spoken a lot about this. We've spoken a lot to see. We found closure and we believe that that was something that my dad, which was a wanted. So we can only sit back and look over the life of Jose. Say that he got what he wanted, he lived a happy life, and he's probably in heaven with my mom, basically looking down on us, unafraid, unapologetic, and such a gentle soul. I am to say that he's a very, very proud of my dad. And finally, in closing, one of the things my dad always said, and I remember this clearly, is he said, if you worry, you die. If you don't worry, you die. Then I guess you were right. Back inside, praise the Lord, I saw the